over the last, uh, particularly the last 10 years in, in Egypt, uh, studying uh, the prehistory of the Egyptian Sahara. The Egyptian Sahara is one of the uh, driest parts of, of the earth. It's an area particularly where we work. It's, uh, it never rains. It has a zero rainfall on average, and maybe once every now and then there'll be a cloud pass over and a, what we call a six-incher will fall. That's six inches between drops. <laughs> uh, and uh, we have spent a, uh, quite a few years uh, uh, working out in that area, trying to get a better understanding of uh, how people manage to live there. The, um, one of the surprising conclusions that we came to is that the Egyptian Sahara may have played a very important role in the beginnings of more complex societies, the rise of pharaonic civilization in the Nile Valley. Before about 6,000 years ago, in the Nile Valley, most of the people were running around hunting and fishing. As we find no signs of any complex social organizations. We find no, no indications they were living in organized villages or that they uh, had uh, any kind of ranking system so that uh, one, it was an egalitarian society. And it, uh, there's not any evidence even that they were engaged in cultivating plants uh, although I suspect they must have had some domestic animals on the grounds that we will discuss a little bit later. But then suddenly, about 6,000 years ago, we find complex societies developing uh, just out of nothing. As they began to have uh, houses organized in special ways, you began to find them building monumental architecture and special places to bury people and different kinds of grave, uh, graveyards uh, for different kinds of people. Some graves had lots of grave goods, others did not, so they clearly had some ranking that was going on. There was clearly some stratification going on. There was some authority uh, evident. And it's long been suggested, while this may have come from the Levant area, uh, where in Palestine, where there had been uh, uh, some, comp some signs of complexity developing uh, uh, for several hundred years prior to that, but unknowns to, uh, to the people at the time, that suggestion that it came all from, from the east, uh, out in the desert, there were some very peculiar things going on. And we think that these peculiar things are, are a result of the adaptation that the people made in order to live in this desert. Now, of course, it was not always a desert. Um, it was not always as dry as it is now. Back in the, in the period when we're going to be talking about tonight, that is, things after about 10,000 years ago, from about 10,000 to about 5,000 years ago, the, um, the, they had a wet period. Well, they really had a, a rather prolonged wet period broken by about three major arid episodes that were fairly short, maybe a couple of hundred years, but really dry. And uh, this wet period in which uh, all of these cultural developments that we're going to be talking about tonight occurred, it was, uh, it was raining a very, around four inches a year. Now, to put that in some perspective, at um, Monahans and Midland out in West Texas, it gets about 10 inches of rain, and, and Desert Valley, and the uh, Desert uh, Death Valley out in California gets about six. And so this Garden of Eden that we we're talking about was, uh, was really a marginal environment. My, my wife has just written a paper which uh, or to be published, and it's called Life on the Edge or something of that sort, and they, they really were on the, on, the, on the edge. But uh, because they were on the edge, they had to make certain adjustments in order to survive out there during that time. Um, and I, I want to carry this through with a series of slides so that you can, can follow along with me. And I'll step down here so I can point out things on the slides. And Amy, could you please uh, turn on the first one? Uh, first, first of all, I don't think any of you need a map of Egypt. After all, if you've been wandering through this building to, for any time at all, you've found Egypt. But the part of Egypt that we want to talk about is this part right in here. Uh, this is, uh, we'll hear me talking about Bir Kasiba, which is right here. And uh, uh, we may mention uh, Bir Safsaf over here and uh, Napta, which is located about in here. Anyway, it's this part of Egypt right in here that's um, uh, where we focus most of our efforts uh, during these, these uh, uh, past 10 or 12 years. Let's see, I think I punched this thing, don't I? Yeah, okay. Now, uh, this is that beautiful 
forested landscape that I was talking about. <laughs> and, uh, and those of you, I'm sure there's some of you here in the audience who have, uh, who have uh, had the pleasure of going to Egypt. And you know that when you fly in, you see this green ribbon, which is the Nile Valley, and you just see the desert on each side. And perhaps some of you thought, well, that just goes out a little ways, and then it gets green again. Well, let me tell you, it doesn't get green again. It just keeps on going on like that. It's just, just the same color as far as we've gone uh, uh, beyond the boundaries of Egypt. Uh, the, uh, but this is a more typical, uh, typical type of landscape that we have out in the desert. Uh, it's not at all Hollywood, is it? It's, um, there are none of these great big piles of sand, but uh, uh, because most of it is rocky and uh, covered with little pebbles. Uh, let's see if I can get this to go. Yeah. And uh, has this, this kind of a, of, a, of a shape to it, lots of soft shales, which are deadly for driving vehicles over uh, because they'll bog down without any warning, whatever. <coughs> there are a few places where, um, where you can get water. This is a place called Bir Kasiba, and it's uh, one of the, uh, r those rare places where, where water can be found by digging a hole. Uh, is there's a fault there. So, mm, something. I guess I better not put this up there. There's a fault there which, uh, which uh, brings water up fairly close to the surface, and, uh, uh, and that line of trees there marks the areas where you can, uh, you can find water. Water uh, is quite uh, potable there. It's, um, it's not exactly the sort of stuff I get out of my faucet. You don't quite have to chew it to swallow it, uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's all we have to drink uh, sometimes when we're there. In fact, most of the time we're there, that's the very best water. But this is a typical beer or well. There are no people out there. There haven't been any people out there for 5,000 years. People have passed through it, but uh, there's no people there. And when we started working out there, and I went out on my first trip into that desert in 1972, I could still see the tracks made by Prince Kamal al-Din when he traversed the area in, in 1934. And we found his, his uh, one of his abandoned vehicles still there. Uh, when uh, uh, we can still see the tracks made by uh, a, a British and Egyptian military group who, uh, during World War I, went out to the Gilf Kabir, north close to the Gilf Kabir, and they, uh, uh, the, the tractor treads, they had some sort of a tractor vehicle along with them, and you can still see those tracks in the sand. So that the sand surface is enormously stable. It's, it, although it blows around a little bit, it's that little loose stuff up on top that blows. The sandy, hard, sandy surface like that one is very stable and doesn't move. Now, these are the kinds of things we think about when we're talking about big dunes, and there are a few of those big accumulation of dunes. And you can see our camp in the distance there. It's very romantic looking, and, and it is indeed a, a, a romantic camp. I've got to admit that. There's a lot of, uh, of uh, beauty in, in, in this scene. There are a couple of Volkswagens uh, uh, they're perched on the side, uh, flirting with disaster. Uh, <laughs> because if he'd gone about four or five feet farther, that thing would have bogged down. It would have taken an awful long time to have gotten it out, or else it would have slipped on down the, the slip face of that dune. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, it didn't happen, so it was one of those better lucks. And here's another one of our camps, in, another, in a more generally typical situation where we, where we live. Now, these, these camps are, uh, we usually have from 30 to 50 people with us when we're there. Um, this is a group, by the way, that, we, that got together in, uh, in 1962 and 63 and formed this thing that we call the Combined Prehistoric Expedition. Now, the Combined Prehistoric Expedition is, is uh, just a, uh, started out as just an association of a group of scholars who like to work together. They were scholars from Poland, scholars from Egypt, and scholars from the United States, from France, and from England, from Italy. Uh, but the three main sponsors of the project were the Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, the Egyptian Geological Survey, and the uh, Southern Methodist University. And I have been the director of that organization since it started. And the people who started with us are still with us. Almost all of the original staff personnel on the project are still working together. We are now even, and that includes even the laborers, we now work the children, our grandchildren, or the men who started with us, but uh, 
uh, they're all still there, at least the families are. How much longer we're going to be able to keep this up, I guess everybody's guessing, but uh, my wife keeps telling me as long as when I get, she gets tired of me, she'll roll me out in my wheelchair and leave me in the <laughs> desert. And, and that'll be the end of the combined prehistoric expedition as I know it anyway. Uh, this is a, uh, our camp and uh, each person, let me give you a couple of sh views of the, of the camp and how, how it looks. This is a, uh, the way the, each um, person in the camp, each scientist has his own tent. Uh, his or her own tent. That's the, the dining tent that you can you can see there. That may be the lab tent. I'm not sure which one they look alike uh, in this particular camp. And uh, as you'll notice, though, there's something I want to invite your attention to, and one of them is that everybody there is bundled up. Uh, now this is taken in January or February when it's winter there, and it freezes at night. Ice freezes solid in our wash basins. Uh, there's um, and during the day it's, uh, it'll warm up a little bit but the wind blows quite a bit and when it does the chill factor is pretty high so we all have uh, long johns, heavy coats, uh, hoods, uh, everything to, uh, to um, you know to stay warm as possible. Um, there's um, uh, let's see I think we've got another one here on this and this uh, Another view, and, and some of you have seen this slide. You've heard me talk about my work and in, in, in our work together in Egypt, and you've perhaps seen this. This is our, our walking uh, meat market. Um, we uh, we all we uh, are a long ways from base. We're about uh, two to four hundred miles from the nearest people, and uh, uh, if we don't take it with us, we don't have it. Um, so we usually take along with us. Uh, uh, a good supply of, um, of fresh meat. And that means that since we don't have electricity, that means it's got to be meat still walking around. And, <laughs> and, uh, so, and uh, chickens just can't make it. They, 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 are, are, um, they just uh, quit. And uh, a turkey, uh, we took turkeys out a couple of times, and turkeys just put their head down on the ground. And, and at the shock of seeing all this, it's, uh, <laughs> and they just put their head down on the ground and die. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> And, but ducks are the toughest dang things around. And uh, they, uh, so we buy a lot of ducks and take them out. And uh, the ducks, uh, the only problem about the ducks is that they, they make a lot of noise at night. Yeah, some of them do. And uh, we put them in a tent. We have a little small tent and put them in that tent at night. In the daytime, they go around, you know, grazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they, but it, uh, at night, they, they've got to go back into that tent. So, so they, and then they get in there and they get to cutting up, you know, and quack, 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 quack. And uh, the duck tent is next to the cook tent. <laughs> and so the, uh, the cook, uh, the next, uh, you know, it doesn't take long. He starts, the next day when we're going to have the first order of business for the cook every, every morning is he gets up and, and selects the duck that's going to be served that night, duck or ducks. And so he watches these ducks go around, and he sees the ones that are making all that quack, quack, quack. Noise. <laughs> <laughs> and so he goes for the quack, quackers. And, and pretty soon, you know, he can go out there and chase ducks around there in one sound being made. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Angela, I don't know how they learned that, but <laughs> they observed that quacker disappears. <laughs> So there you can see our cook looking over the, uh, looking over the stock and, and deciding which ones he's going to go after. And then there behind him is the, is the lab tent where we do all of our analyses and, and that sort of thing in the dining, in the dining tent. And then behind that is, uh, is, is uh, our tent, Angela and I, because we're the, the only married people uh, out there with a husband and wife. We, have, we uh, claim a slightly larger tent than the other one, uh, than the other folks. And, uh, and it, it's really quite comfortable. It's big enough so you can stand up in. You can't stand up in those other tents. Uh, now, this is how we get those camps out there. It takes about two loads of these things. It's, it looks just like a bunch of uh, lost Okies. Uh, <laughs> there. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the firewood that the people, because we have, uh, they cook their, the bread on, the, on wood. So that's the firewood you see hanging on the back of the thing, because there are not an awful lot of trees out there. So everyone, Go by anybody that has that tree that's not being watched and loses a few limbs. <laughs> and, uh, and this is, they pile up all the gear and then the, and all the Bedouins. This, this is one Bedouin band that has worked with me since 1962. 
and they're, they're headmen, and, and, and I have a, have a pact with each other. We're going to keep working as long as both of us are alive. And it's, it's been a, he's a miraculous gentleman. He knows that. They, they were smugglers, I've got to tell you. This whole band was a band of smugglers and, and uh, other activities, I'm sure, that I don't want to know about. <laughs> and uh, and uh, their, their, their association with us uh, during this time, they have transformed themselves from a group of sort of ragamuffins on the edge of the desert to really outstanding and, and very uh, uh, pillars of society. Uh, they are now bought land, have land now along the, uh, on the edge of the, of, the, uh, of the valley, and it's irrigated. And uh, one of the young fellows came along, and I thought, you know, all these years I've been doing these people a great service. I did at first, I'm sure. It was the only job they could probably get. Uh, they get extra wages for beyond the normal ones for going with us because uh, ordinary people won't go out in this desert. Uh, they, um, but they, they, um, uh, <coughs> the, uh, these people. One of the day, one day, uh, I was talking with one of them. He was kind of mumbling a little bit about wanting more money, and I, I said, "Well, you know, don't we aren't we paying you enough? It seems like it's a premium." He said, uh, and. I'll uh, clean it up a little bit. He said, you know, my, my wife makes more on her egg money than you pay me. And I, and I said, well, why do you come? He says, I come out here. We all come out here to get away from my wives and children. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, uh, <laughs> this is looked at by all of us as a bit of a sport. It's serious scientists do that to us, the scientists. It's a bit of a sport to them. They, it's a great game. They go out, they dance, they work all day, and they dig like mad. They're the hardest working people I've ever known. And then they, the young boys, at least, will dance you know, half the night away. They have stick dances and, and all of this sort of stuff going on. Get all of our girl graduate students over to watch them and that sort of thing. <laughs> Don't they, Amy? <laughs> and then, then, of course, I have to mention how we get around in the desert. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, th those, those Volkswagen 181s were a disaster. <laughs> the thing over there on the side, that, that, that Land Rover, that's the thing to get around in the desert. It's got to have four-wheel drives, all of them driving at one time, and you can go anywhere. We rarely get that thing stuck in, unless we're just bidding, uh, not paying any attention and get careless. But the 181s, had, we had to carry tracks. You can see the sand tracks behind them there. And, um, it didn't dare get too far away from somebody who could help him push out because it was, uh, they, they were always being stuck. But they were light vehicles, and we used them for reconnaissance in areas where there was not soft, sticky sand. We, uh, we also have a lot of uh, maintenance problems because uh, we have a lot of vehicles. Uh, some of them, we have these heavy trucks that are loaned to us by the, gov by the Egyptian government. Uh, they're, not, they're not the very best. Uh, of condition, and uh, uh, so, but we go out with what I consider to be the best field mechanics that is in existence anywhere. We can change axles, uh, we can change springs, we can change uh, overhaul a motor. That's what they're doing right now. They decided they wanted to overhaul that motor, and so that motor is being stripped down, taken apart, be put back together, and it'll run. It has to run because we're lost out there if that thing doesn't run. <laughs> so every, everything about that motor is about to come apart. But they are great mechanics. We have uh, usually two or three mechanics along with us to keep all of our vehicles operating. Well, this is how we get our water. Uh, we dig a hole. <coughs> and uh, you can see there, that's you know, about so deep where we got water. And it's, uh, it, it's um, uh, a little high on, uh, on some salts. Uh, but uh, it, it does satisfy the, the need for something to drink. And our Bedouins are also our major providers of, of bread. You know, it's a, if you take a normal Egyptian bread uh, out into the desert with you, uh, it, it'll last forever, but it's like concrete after about a week. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very hard. It gets really hard. And uh, when it's fresh, it's just soft and the most delicious bread there is. So, uh, but what, the normal bread is just unpalatable or it breaks a lot of teeth. When, after it's been dried for, for a couple of three weeks. So we hit upon the idea of, of eating the Bedouin bread. And so we give them flour, and they, they make bread for themselves and make bread for us. And it's done with these, uh, sort of looks like a big tortilla, unleavened bread. And then they, they put it on a, 
on the top of a, they uh, make, roll it out on, on one of our water cans, and then they uh, uh, put it on the top of a, of a top cut out of a steel drum to make a, a little stove top, and then they, they cook it very quickly on both sides, flip it over, and it's very delicious bread. And every day we get fresh bread made by our Bedouin workers. And as you can see, life is uh, sometimes very, very pleasant. Uh, this is uh, probably about the first day of March. The summer comes on the first day of March. It, it shifts from freezing to about 110 degrees. And, uh, and I'm not kidding. It'll be freezing one day, and the next day it's 110 degrees. And it's, uh, it's a remarkable shift of, uh, uh, from there are no springs. It's just that winter and then summer. And uh, here we are enjoying our first days of summer, sitting around having a cup of tea, perhaps, uh, uh, and I guess this was in, uh, at noontime. And uh, uh, then, however, uh, just so you won't think it's always sunny and nice, this is what happens a lot of time. We have a good, good many uh, uh, sandstorms. Um, and uh, as Amy, I think, can tell you, they blow down tents. Uh, everybody's got a got a box in their tent, mine including, we have, and everything that you don't want to lose goes in that box because uh, we had one of our graduate students who had his dissertation, PhD dissertation, almost finished sitting on his bed and uh, word to him said, you know, there may be a homsoon coming. This is a, uh, one of these strong winds coming. And uh, he's, we were about to sit down to dinner and he, he said, well, after dinner, I'll go, I'll go, uh, clean up my tent, and uh, right in the middle of dinner, it hit, and like a, uh, you know, just suddenly, uh, without any warning at all, and his tent blew over, and the largest piece of his dissertation we ever found was about the size of a, of a half dollar. Um, he, he became a geologist. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a loss to us because he was a very bright boy, but it did break his spirit. Now, let me go back over the map a bit and, and tell you a little bit more about what we're going to be looking at. Uh, uh, the area that we're going to focus in is this area right in here. And that little rippled area, that means sandy areas, those little ripple zone there, that's the sandy areas. And particularly, that's a very flat sand sheet that's just flat as a billiard table for, uh, you know, 50, 60 miles in all directions, maybe 100 miles in sort of north, south, 50, 60 miles in the other direction. It's very flat. Uh, there are here and there are some ripple areas, but by and large, it's a very flat sand sheet. And uh, the other, now that area was also used by these people, and we'll talk a little bit about how they used it. And then, then here around Bir Kasiba, and there's a whole series of basins around here, and it not to another series of basins. And over out here at uh, Bir Sasaf, which is right in here, there's another series of basins that uh, uh, we'll, uh, and sites that we'll be talking about. Now, the, the, um, uh, it's, I'll, I'll try to avoid any of this technical jargon, but I've got to, I, I know that I better explain one thing to you uh, before I, before I, because I won't, I won't, uh, if I start talking about it and you don't understand what I mean, I'll be saying a word like playa. Now, uh, Many of you from out in West Texas know what playas are because we've got a lot of them out there. These are basins that have temporary water in them. And when the water comes in, it brings in lots of silt and sediments and so on. So you get sediment accumulation in the bottom of these things, and then it dries up and it cracks. And so if you've ever driven across West Texas and, and, and eastern New Mexico or right out in Nevada and those areas, you've seen lots of things called that people refer to as playas. Now, in, in the area east of this sand sheet, there are lots of these playas. And these are the places where the populations congregated. Are you, is it loud enough for you back, back there with this noise? Thank you very much. Okay. If you want me to speak up, I'll talk up loud. But the, in, these, um, in these playas, we think these are the places where the people congregated and lived for the longest periods of time each year. Now, it's there that we find most of the, of the rich archaeological sites. And we, these things accumulated and had wa held water in them seasonally during these, this rainy period, during this period of the Pleistocene, post-Pleistocene, early Holocene, uh, from about, say, 10,000 years ago 
to about 5,000 years ago, these basins that had been scoured out by a long period of aridity just prior to that. And so this is, uh, this is the area now that most of these things uh, we're going to be looking at occur in. And out in this area, you walk, you drive around, and, and uh, uh, of course, we, we have uh, done most of our reconnaissance work in vehicles. We drive around, and we, uh, we find lots of things like this. Now, these are houses that are, are of what I, we call late Neolithic. That is, they are probably about 67,000 years old. And they are part of the communities of people that were out there just before it got so dry they had to give up and go back to the Nile Valley. And, and there, are, there are numerous sites of this kind out in the desert. Uh, much more common than that, however, are sites where you don't find any sign of a structure. Nothing at all, no structure at all. But you find thousands of pieces of broken rock, lots of artifacts, lots of tools. Um, by the way, for those, I'm, I'm sure there's some of you in here who are or have been amateur archaeologists or who have collected arrowheads. Well, I was one when I was a kid. And um, uh, as a professional archaeologist, I, I now recognize that I did a lot of harm by my collecting surface material. Because what I have, what we have when we're working in the Sahara there is perhaps one of the few, if not the only place on Earth that you can now go and see rocks lying around on the ground where they were laying down 10,000 years ago and know that nobody's ever picked them up since. There hadn't been anybody pick them up, move them around, or do anything with them. And so uh, we can look at things and understand the structure of the society or understand how the, what the people were doing at the time. We can get a lot of information out of the way these things are patterned on the ground that you simply can't do from, from archaeological sites, uh, house out in West Texas or, or in around Terrell where I grew up and uh, uh, where I cleaned most of the sites of all their, their goodies. Uh, but here, you can see lots of grinding stones lying on the ground. Those big things are, are all grinding stones that they used to grind wheat and barley in. We know that because at this particular site, we, we dug here and we found grains of wheat and grains of barley uh, associated with this, with this thing. And then all of those millions of rocks uh, that, that we have at, at that particular site. Here's one of those grinding stones. Uh, there, as you can see, that looks like about a six-inch ruler there. And these are the little hand stones that, that they use to, uh, to grind the, the grains and the cereals in uh, that they <coughs> were growing. They grew them out there. And uh, they did it by a very ingenious way. Uh, also, when we walk across the desert, we find other things. Sometimes we can find ostrich eggshell water bottles. And here, uh, Dr. Close has just come upon two ostrich eggshell water bottles buried in the sand, upside down in the sand. And these were on a, on a sand dune overlooking a, 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 which had been temporarily occupied by a group and then overlooks a big site down in the, in the bottom of a playa that's nearby, that temporary basin, temporary lake. And once we've uh, selected the sites, and there are thousands of them out there, uh, we, we have to then make a choice of uh, what sites to cons do we study, what, what are the problems that we're working on, and what, which of these sites will yield the information that we're looking for. And then the first thing we do is make some sort of a map of it, that is, we grid the site in one meter squares, it's about a yard squares, and then um, uh, we uh, pick up and place on a map every artifact in the site. That is, everything comes up from the, from the surface, if it doesn't hop, it gets put in a bag. <laughs> and, if, and if it's uh, uh, and not only put in a bag, it gets numbered and identified, and they're coding. We have a very elaborate coding system. And she's uh, probably just giving me some, uh, uh, this is Dr. Close, my wife, there in this thing. She's probably giving me some pointers on, on typology there as, uh, as we're about to uh, record this particular site. But every, these thousands of pieces will be picked up from the surface of the site and this elaborate map made so that we can then analyze the patterns and distributions of the artifacts that, uh, that are there. This happens before any excavations are done. Now here is another kind of site, which uh, uh, now she's in a house. Um, the, uh, uh, th this, is, uh, this takes a little bit of imagination. Most archaeology takes a little bit of imagination. But if you look at that surface, you see that there's a, 
there's an area there that's kind of circular that it's got, it hasn't got any rocks in it. And if you look on beyond it, you see there's another one, and then another one beyond that, and then another one over on the right. There are about, actually, there are about five or six of those cleared areas with, uh, with, uh, within the areas of rocks, surrounded by rocks. We didn't know what those were when we first came upon them, and so we had to excavate them and found out that these were houses. They are, uh, they were, now this is down in the bottom of a lake that every year filled up with water during the rainy season, which was in the summers, summer rainy season. Every day here it'd fill up, there'd be maybe five, six feet of water or more in this, uh, in this temporary lake. And uh, then when it would dry out, people would go and live there. Now they'd live there because they could dig holes and get water. And because you could get wells, dig, dig a hole down there and get, and, and get water at a reasonable depth. But uh, they would put up a temporary wooden structure that would probably mark the house, some sort of a wooden thing. I'll show you something. And then around those, they would uh, put some sort of mats, or maybe they'd put brush or something else, and uh, something to cover it from the winter, uh, from the winds during the winter months and so on. And then uh, when the rain would come again, they'd pull out of there and leave the house. And then the next year, they would, then when the rains had evaporated again, they'd all come back, sit on the dune, and wait till the last water's dried. And that's when those water bottles were found, by the way. The last rains had dried up. And uh, they could still see as the water would drop, they'd see their houses. You see the roof, the, the post would be sticking out where their houses were. And they would go back in there and uh, clean out that house a little bit and throw the stuff from the house around the edge of it, just scrape it out. Yeah, that's why all that pile of stuff was around the edge of the house there. And then they, uh, they'd go in, build a fireplace, and set up the walls again and do it right, fix it over, and start over. How do we know this? Because we find, first of all, we find when we dig the things, we find uh, uh, traces of, of mud, burned mud and, and clay in, in the places in the walls where they'd, they'd pack mud around the, around the wooden post and you can still see the, the imprints of the sticks and the stones. And we find fireplaces, one right on top of another, each separated by an inch or two of silt from the, from the previous flood. So they'd accumulate and then there'd be one right on top of the other. Just a whole series of these fireplaces stacked up one on top of the other. So it, it meant they, they, had, they didn't take all their posts out each year, you know, when it started raining. They left their posts there so that they could find where their houses were. And each time, they came back to that same house and, uh, and rebuilt it. And here's uh, one of the upper houses in, in this particular house that we showed you a picture of earlier. And <clears throat> now, some of the sites are, are a little, little uh, more complex than that. They have. Uh, now, uh, this one has a series of pits that you can see. It's just very shallow. You'll notice that this is, uh, we just took a very, uh, we took a little hole light device and very carefully scraped the surface to take the surface the veneer off to, and it was only about so far down below until we got to the level where their, where their occupation was. Now, this occupation occurred about 8,100 years ago. We have 13 radiocarbon dates all within about 50 years of that 8,100 years ago. So we're pretty well, happy about that we've dated this site. And this one is particularly interesting because it's the first time we have proof that they were living year-round in the desert. Prior to that time, we find that the people were out there up to maybe around 10,000 years ago, but so far as we know, they were not there permanently. We find no good indications that they were there year-round. Now, the, the, um, this, this is a, has a, a lot of kind of interesting things about it. These, um, these, this is a, 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 what was the remains of a house. These are the burned uh, uh, mats or grass or whatever it was that was around the edge of the house that collapsed in here. And you can see the dark stain of the floor. And then there's a, a fireplace there in one spot. Now, each of these houses, and there were, there were two rows of these houses. They were aligned in rows. This is the earliest organized village that we have anywhere in this part of the world. They were lined in rows, and they were they were, uh, and each house uh, had a, a big storage pit beside it. And out in front of the houses, in front of the second, the furthest row out front, there was a great big walk-in well, deep well, you know, something about uh, uh, 10 to 11 feet deep. I've forgotten the exact depth, but uh, uh, a very deep well where they could get water in the dry season. And that's how they were able to stay there during that period. Now, the, the um, these people also grazed barley, 
and they stored their crops and stored their tools and leave it during when it would get wet they'd leave it to go to higher ground and then uh, uh, they would store their tools and, and garbage and things in these pits and here's one of the pits that you can just see uh, coming up in the, in the surface as the student there is, is grading away the, the top of the drown. Here's one of the pits. It's just see that little thing in the corner there? Let me see if I can point this out for you. Uh, right in here, you see that dark line? And there's the other side of it right in here. This is a pit that goes around like this, something like that. And this one was a, uh, was a pit that, uh, uh, that, was <coughs> that was left open when the flood came because it filled up with, uh, uh, with silts from the, from the flood. Uh, most of the, of the pits, however, had been covered over and uh, didn't have this, this kind of fill. This one, for some reason, was left, left open. Now, this is the way that village, after we got through all scraping everything around there, this is the way that village looked. And you can see the, these lines of houses, and each one of them with a big pit in front of it. And uh, uh, we have hypothesized that it was this organizational ability, that is, this, uh, this ability to tell people, you're going to put your houses in this row, and your houses are in this row. Now, you're not going to be sitting around higgly-piggly all over the landscape. You're going to do it this way. You know, it sounds like the Zoning Commission, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, that, that, uh, that this is the sort of, this is the one clue we have of sort of social uh, discipline that it took to be a successful exploiter of that environment. And it, this discipline is, a, this is the thing that first appears later, 2,000 years later, that begins the transformation of the Egyptian societies in the Nile Valley. Uh, as the people began to leave the desert and moving to the Nile Valley, this discipline that we can see from this point on appears suddenly in the Nile Valley. And it is for this reason that we think that the, the people in the, in the desert had something very significant to do with the beginnings of more complex societies in, in Egypt. Well, not all of the, of the sites, this was a uh, uh, another little house. Uh, this one is a, oh, about uh, uh, 7,500 years old. And uh, not all of the sites were big villages like this. Uh, some of them were single houses scattered out in, in little small playas in one place or another. Now, this is a, uh, a, an important point because it tells us that there wasn't any warfare going on, or at least there wasn't any raiding or banditry and that sort of thing because single families living in a in a house, you know, all by itself, uh, out quite way away from its neighbors, would, would have any kind of periods of trouble, they all aggregate together so they can be mutually defended. But there are lots of these little, small, one, two house communities scattered all around, and, and, they, and every one of the smaller basins have them. Now, not all of the sites are small or medium sized. We have uh, this one here, which is about half a mile long and a quarter of a mile wide, and it, um, it is uh, over six feet deep. And it is also, unlike the other sites, it is located at the, at the, above the playas, above these basins. It's located on a big dune overlooking the playas, overlooking this basin. Now, uh, this one really puzzled us for a long time. First of all, why were they continuing to come back to that spot, and why did they continue to use that place for, for several thousand years, and why was it located way up here and when all of our other sites are down there in the basins? Well, it, we think it's part of this social system, this complex social system that they had worked out. This is the place where all of those scattered people that were scattered all around in that desert came once a year to aggregate. We think it must have been, and this is again a hypothesis, we, because this site's got to go, we're, gonna, we're planning on redoing some excavation there this coming January. The, um, we think it must have been during the summer rainy season. That's why the sites are up on high. This they picked the place that was way up high, and uh, so it'd be out of the water. The this particular playa that this is this is right on the beach of that big playa, and this particular playa got 15 or 20 feet of water in it um, during its maximum of stand, and this site is just just stands just above that that beach line, and. Uh, we feel that this is the place where they came for aggregation of all the populations. They came together for 
social problems, social, you know, socializing for uh, uh, wife uh, locating, betrothal, religious ceremonies, all those activities that gave them the feeling of, of we, of the group cohesion that was there. And that, uh, so that, and they came, they didn't build a lot of houses. We already know that they came and lived in very ephemeral, temporary kinds of structures. But they did one other thing that I want to talk about. They slaughtered lots of cows here. Now, cattle, in fact, is one of the secrets of how the man was able to go out into this desert. And none of the sites have very many, none of those other sites that I've talked about have very many cattle bones, but almost all of them have two or three bones in them. And, but this site has lots of bones in it. And it's today a modern practice that African pastoralists consider their cattle to be their assets, their resources. They're a walking bank book. Uh, they, they don't kill cows for meat. Cattle are used for milk and blood and as a source of prestige and establishment. The only time they kill cows is for a big ceremonial event, uh, you know, the death or the marriage or something of one of their leaders or something of this sort. Cows are, are too precious a commodity to waste for you know, any other purpose. Now, the very first groups that we have out here in this Sahara, dating at about 10,000 years ago, have domestic cattle. They are the oldest domestic cattle, among the oldest domestic cattle that we know anywhere in the world. And these, uh, here we are living in an area where cattle simply could not exist unless man had taken them there and looked after them, gave them water, and brought them back. A cow will only go, he has to drink every day, unlike a lot of us. He, he's got to have water every day, or she has got to have water every day. So that uh, cattle will not wander away from the Nile Valley on their own. They've got to be close at hand and so unless people will take them out. So these few cow bones that we've found out there are not only out of place in a biological sense, they're also uh, genetically different from the, from the wild cattle that still were present in the Nile Valley. But it's the ecology of it that's very important. But it's this resource, this is probably the reason they went out there because there's very little wealth. They were the only animals that they had there that they could eat for hunting, and we have a lot of, a lot of these bones preserved in these uh, early Neolithic sites. The only things that were out there were, were a few gazelle and, a, and, and, and hares, rabbits, and then these big cows. That's the only thing they had. So that uh, this was a, a, a major uh, eco economic factor that permitted the people to work in the desert and not only permitted it, it's probably the reason why they went out there, because of the grassland that uh, they could then uh, use for their, for their, um, uh, their cows to, to graze on. Now, <clears throat> here's a, uh, another one of our uh, techniques here. We've scraped the surface very gently to find another site just below the top. Can you, uh, can you see, uh, get this thing jumbled together here, if you look carefully, you'll see a little circle right here. Not a really little, that's a big circle. And you'll see another one right over here, just slightly intersecting that, and another one right over here, and another one right here. And out here, there's another one someplace right around here. It goes around like this, kind of irregular one. Well, we, uh, when we scraped this surface, we, we would just see, what can we find? That was the sort of motivation. We had no real clue what was going to be there. And uh, so we scraped this large area off and to see if, if there were any features that were evident. And then we saw these great huge circles, and we said, what in the dickens are those? And so then we had to dig one of them, and it, it, uh, yeah, they're hard to dig because it's like digging in concrete. But uh, uh, we did dig half of this one right here in, in the uh, center there, uh, just to just get some idea of what it was like. <clears throat> and here's uh, half of it. Uh, or a third of it, two-thirds of it, I think about a half. Uh, the, the, this is not the depth of it. The, the, he's standing on a shelf. It's, it's another bit, another that much deeper on, on down. Um, they were, it was like a, a shelf down and then another shelf down and then on over on the side there was a place where, where uh, a, a very shallow pool. Uh, these were wells that were dug down to the water table uh, during the dry season, and it's, you can see there were big wells. These are the wells they needed 
feed those for the cattle, for their cattle herds. This is the secret of how they were able to uh, keep those cattle operating out there. <coughs> now, looking at uh, on the Salima sand sheet, this big flat sand sheet that I'm telling you about, it is flat in it. Fr from it's even worse than the Ano Estacado. Uh, those of you who live out in Lubbock, you know, on that forest and telephone poles out there, uh, <laughs> <they have> <laughs> uh, it's flatter than Lubbock. And uh, uh, it's a very flat landscape. Uh, now, we find thousands of sites out in that flat, flat landscape. All of them, little bitty things. If you, uh, you see what uh, she, I guess it is, she is looking at there is the site, all of it. See that little clump of rocks right there? That, that's, that's the whole site. And it's, uh, there are thousands of those scattered all over the landscape. Well, now, our reconstruction of the environment tells us that this area was a grassland. At the time, it had four inches of rain on it. But people could only use that right after the rains. There's, there's, uh, they, if they didn't have water nearby, they wouldn't be able to stay there because there are no basins, you see. They couldn't dig these wells, so there was no place to But during the, right after the rainy season, when the grasses would be up and they'd use, and I'm sure that our, at least our reconstruction is that the young boys would be sent out with their cow herds to move on out into the distance and, uh, and graze as they went and keep going. And then as it started to get real dry, they had to start coming back and be back in the valley, be back in those basins where they had those deep wells by the time it really got dry. So there's a, there was a seasonal pattern of moving back and forth. And this is one of those, one of those camps by a couple of boys. With their, uh, and here's another one. They would take with them raw, some very few tools. They'd take a very few simple little knives or scrapers and something of that sort. And then they would always, uh, they had either had stockpiled out there or they carried with them big rocks. Of, uh, of quartzitic sandstone that they could use for making more stone tools because scattered over the landscape, and you can see one off in the distance there, are occasional big rocks. We, we have thought about those as being um, sort of a, a, as a store, you know, a cache that they had carried out. We found uh, one huge rock. It's just, I can't help but remind, tell you about this. A big rock, must weigh 50 or 60 pounds. Now, the nearest source for these rocks is probably about 30 miles away. So now they picked that thing up and carried it about 30 miles. When they got it out there, they started to do some work on it. And they knocked off a few flakes, and then all of a sudden, it shattered. It shattered, you know. And then somebody else came along a little bit later. My, my wife has feeded all these rocks back together. Somebody else came along and has a camp over 100 yards away. And they picked up one of these rocks and carried it over there, and they tried to flake one of the pieces of the shatter, and they tried to flake it, and it shattered. Can you imagine the man's uh, vocabulary when he carried that damn rock out there for, <laughs> for 20, 30 miles, and, <laughs> and he gets it out there, and about a third blow, it shatters? Uh, it's, well, <clears throat> this is uh, our sort of primitive reconstruction of the of the, of the uh, environment there. And uh, if you'll bear with me a second, I'll just tell you this. Over here on, on, on this side, this is the dry and, and going drier up here to, to today. And then this line represents a wetter period and then a dry, sharp dry cycle, and then another wet peak, and then another drying, and then dry and peak here, and then another one here, and these, these little peaks and, uh, and then back down here at about 11,000. This is 11,000 years ago, and this is about 5,000 up here. And th this is something out of one of our publications. These are all the radiocarbon dates that we, we had when that, uh, when that thing was published that uh, related to, to this sequence. Uh, the interesting thing is that every time one of those little, and by the way, <coughs> how much time have I taken up? I'm gonna talk too long. Um, uh, every time one of those little flips that occur and it get hyper arid, Everybody in the, it disappeared. The people that were out there disappeared. They didn't make it during those dry periods. And a new punch came in. A totally different population would come back in. It wouldn't be the same people at all. So that we had a very, uh, those dry periods were very pronounced and very dramatic and very important in, this, in the uh, utilization of the Sahara because 
people were there, very well adjusted and so on, and to, to the, whatever environment they had. And uh, I would assume there that, say, three inches of rain was probably, looks like, or two peaks and then up to the four, and maybe once there or twice, might have gotten five inches of rain. That this is, uh, uh, that those, they get adjusted that, and all of a sudden it, the uh, hyperridity comes in worse than the 1930s drought by, by several magnitudes. And um, uh, then <coughs> the um, uh, people all have to leave, died out, did something. So they went somewhere else, we don't know where probably back to the Nile Valley, and then uh, rain up again, and then a whole new population with different culture, different uh, type toolkits, different things would reappear. Now, one of the reasons I put that up here is so that um, this is part of my other one of my little uh, bandwagons I'm on these days. Uh, you've all heard about global warming, and you know that there are a lot of proposals being made to, for us to change our lifestyles, and, and we give up our automobiles and go back to bicycles, and, and uh, and do all sorts of things like that. And the, the uh, climatic record for that is about 200 years long. And there's not even real good uh, uh, agreement among scientists as to the accuracy of that 200 year climatic record. Now, I want to point out that there have been several major climatic changes in the last 10,000 years that have had profound effects on man, of which man had nothing to do with, no automobiles, nothing else. So I urge that before we go and make, uh, and I'd like to get rid of all that hydrocarbon out of my lungs too, but uh, before we make too many uh, commitments in our society to, uh, to um, uh, build dikes out and keep, the, keep Houston from going underwater, that we, um, uh, we wait and see uh, what's really going to happen about our global climatic change. Now this is the sort of cycle that uh, we've, uh, a device for, I'm not sure that's sharp enough. Can everybody read that thing? Or is it my eyes that are fuzzy? Uh, 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 rains would be in June, July, and August. Uh, and um, <clears throat> then drying out from, from there from September through to January. And then the driest period of the year would have been from February, ah, great, February to May. Now we can see it, by God. God. Uh, well, with these things, on, sometimes I don't know if it's me or the, or the, uh, or the projector or this stuff. Uh, but um, if you'll, you can see our, our reconstruction of the, of the climatic cycle. And uh, uh, we'll notice now we've got this in terms of their settlement system. They had, uh, during the period of the rains, they were at that big site, or another one like it, maybe 30 miles away that we haven't found. Uh, that big site where many of the smaller communities all aggregated together. And they did all their ceremonies and their and their patrols and, and uh, other activities that people do when you get in large groups. And uh, then, as it got drier, when the rain stopped and it got drier, people then moved to the uh, uh, away from this big site over to the smaller basins. And when they first got to these smaller basins, they had to, they they still had some water in them, and so they would camp on them. This establishes their ownership by being near. They camped on the dunes adjacent to these basins, and we find their sites there on these dunes. And then as the thing, would, they wouldn't be there very long, and then it would dry up enough, and they'd move down and do what they, we talked about earlier about building all these, uh, rebuilding all these houses. And some of the people would then move on uh, to the lower parts of big basins, and some of them would move into the little small basins. And uh, then each group, which probably all had their cattle herders and their, and their young boys and so on. Do They would go off, send their cattle off into the, into the hills and onto that, uh, onto that uh, Salima sand sheet area with all its grazing so that they'd be gone for a while and several weeks or months until the grass had been exhausted and then they'd start coming back. Um, if a cow, they, the people that have done studies of primitive herders today have told us that if cattle will not go more than about 10 miles from, for feeding from water. So that uh, they've got to, a cow can walk out and walk back 10 miles, but they, that's as far as they'll graze. So the only way they could get way out there on that sand sheet is that there, was, there had to have been some water available in little holes here and there, a little temporary water. And as soon as that was gone, the people had to come back. Now, I want to uh, take just a little bit now and talk a little about what this country must have been like uh, and uh, I want to uh, show you a few pictures of a trip that uh, some of us made 
from El Fasher here. We actually made it from uh, Jebel Mata, which is right here in, in western Sudan, to El Fasher, and then northward from there into Sahara. And because uh, that's an area, uh, this, this region right about here where I'm going to be uh, talking about, uh, showing you some pictures, is, uh, is, is an area that has today about four inches of rainfall. And it has populations living there who are cattle pastoralists and uh, farmers very much like those that may have been living in the, in the western desert of Egypt back in the uh, eight to 10,000 years ago. Now this is what the landscape looks like. Uh, it's got these acacia trees. Uh, it's probably a little more wooded than, than it was up there in Egypt. Uh, this, is, this is next to a, uh, an upland area, so it gets a little more rainfall in, in this particular spot. But it's mostly grasslands and, uh, and, some, uh, uh, and some trees along the drainages and on the hill slopes. And down in the bottoms of their playas, we find these houses. Now these houses are all lived in in the winters, during the dry season, and in the, in the summer months, they go up into the hills and the mountains. Or excuse me, I'm saying it the wrong way around. They're always lived in in the, in the summer months, and in the winter months, they go up in the mountains where they have water. So that uh, that's these, when we were there, they were abandoned structures. Um, but these are much like the ones that we think, uh, from the evidence we have from the archaeology, and the posts and post holes and the brush and so on, that we found down in the bottom of those playas that uh, we saw in, in, uh, uh, at, uh, at, the, at Bir Kasiba. And they have cows. And, and they're not great cows. Uh, most uh, Texas ranchers wouldn't let them have the grass, but uh, there, there are a lot of them. And, uh, uh, there, there literally are thousands of cows in, in this area. Uh, and then uh, I'll show you a couple of pictures of what some of these cows look like. Uh, look at the uh, horns on this, on this one right here. Uh, the, uh, this baby right here, see those, those horns there? And you can see some others with funny looking horns. Well, let me go show you the next slide. Uh, this one was taken uh, in Alfasher and uh, uh, there are three bulls there. See those horns? See those horns? Look at those horns. Now, I want to show you something else. Uh, these are Neolithic wall paintings from the, some of the caves in the area to the farther west from, from where we're working. And I've got a whole series of these. These are really dramatic uh, pictures of the uh, uh, and uh, there's so much to be learned about them. I, I think it gives us a picture of what they thought of themselves and how they, they perceived their life. These are not the same sort of, I don't believe these are the same sorts of things that we have Paleolithic paint, cave paintings which seem to have had some sort of magical things. These people are drawing pictures and they're beautiful pictures. They're, they're, their artistic uh, capabilities were really, really outstanding. And notice those cows, aren't those, and, and they've got, uh, They've got brands on them or ownership marks. See, each one of them's got a red dot there. Uh, and then, uh, well, I guess that's, that's my interpretation. And uh, then uh, here's, here's a, a, a kind of a, a village scene. Uh, let me see if I can't uh, get, get through that. Um, first of all, these are sheep and goats around the camp. And uh, you see a bunch of fellows standing here. Here's a, a, a house. Uh, I think that's a house. And uh, a woman sitting there or somebody sitting in front of it. Now the interesting bit is this, here's a pot. Here's another pot over here and, and, a, and a container on top of it and this pot. And if you'll look, those of you up front here, and the guys in the back, just take my word for it, there's a, there's a straw coming right out of that top pot. Now, uh, my wife, who knows more about that sort of thing, tells me that in order to, uh, to uh, drink beer, uh, homemade brews like that, that you've, um, uh, you, you use a straw because it goes through the gunk if you try to drink it. <laughs> Any of you homebrew makers know about this? Any, anyway, uh, uh, that, I, I take her word for it, and I do believe they're drinking beer. Uh, and uh, they're, uh, uh, it's a, it's a uh, uh, little fascinating scene there. Uh, the, uh, get the wrong one here. <coughs> I'm getting, we're getting near the end of this thing. Uh, here's a, another 
seen in the same general area. And you notice the women riding on the, on the, uh, on the, on the cows. Uh, they've got some sort of a saddle on them or a blanket or something or other. Uh, they don't seem to have any bridles or anything, but so they're just probably herding along, and they get on the backs of the cows and go along as the herd as it moves. Uh, and they have rather elaborate hairdos. Um, I also am going to call your attention to their skin color, because I think this is the way they perceive themselves, is the way they depicted themselves. And here's another one. Now, I did that so you'd see this one, because it's, uh, now, uh, this is a house with its pots and its people around it, and another house over here. And uh, I don't know what that funny stuff up in this tarps, but clearly those two, I think I could say females, at least one I missed, uh, that are there are, are uh, Negroids. Now here's another scenic view I think is rather interesting out there. Uh, these are cows drinking at the well. Cows drinking at the well. And it's, I think, a, a, a rather interesting. These are the, the, because each of these deep wells had beside it a little shallow pool where they dumped the water out, you know, in a leather, in a leather bag they dumped this water out. We know they still do that today. That's how they feed their cows. That's why I can say they, we don't find the leather bags, but that, I'm pretty sure that's how they did it dumped it out on, on the, under the shallower there so the cows could then come up and drink right around this, this pool. And then our last one. Here is a, a view of, a, of a, one of the wells. You can see the, get my gadget here. You can see the, um, uh, over here, over here on this side. See that right there? Now here's the well. And here they are getting the water from the well. And here's the little pool beside the well. And, and there's the cow having, having a drink from the well. Well, I think they perceived of their lives and depicted it very well for us. And I would close by saying, I think there were all kinds of people out there uh, and that all kinds of people took part in the development of, of Egyptian civilization. It certainly wasn't all one, one racial group. Africa is a, is a conglomerate of lots of different people. And surely uh, uh, these pictures depict, at least as they saw themselves, with a diversity of, of uh, racial types. Well, from here, things got worse. It got very dry. They had artists. They had a uh, complex um, uh, political system, which somebody told them when to move and when to hop and when to stop. They told them when to build something, when to dig something. They, had, uh, they built very fine, they made fine stone polished axes, which became a, a very important uh, uh, symbol of power in, in pharaonic and uh, pre-dynastic Egypt. Uh, they, they had paint palettes. They had uh, trade goods from some Sinai made of, uh, of turquoise. They had seashells from the Red Sea. They had copper objects. They had many, many things that set the stage for the beginning of Egyptian civilization. And when the climate turned bad, probably shortly after 6,000 years ago, there was a sudden depopulation of the area. Sites become very, very rare and finally disappear at 5,000, but by around 6,000 they began to disappear. And it is exactly at that time that we find a great increase in population in the Nile Valley, particularly in the areas around where the earliest pre-dynastic uh, societies occur. And in these areas, or right next to this, where it'd be very easy for the people to go from the desert into the Nile Valley. And so we've gotten this very, um, exotic and certainly not proven hypothesis, but this is the trigger that started the beginnings of Egyptian civilization. Thank you very much. Well, I, I think it's traditional, yes. <laughs> sure. Most of the of the routes that uh, that cross the Sahara that we have looked at, and we've seen some of their camps and sites out there, uh, dating from the Muslim period, um, and I, some of them from Roman period times, um, 
they're north-south, and they're involved in, in uh, I think, slave trading. Um, they're, uh, these that we're looking at are east-west, and I don't think they ever got, there's no indication that they ever got very far west. That is, they never got uh, into what's now Libya, because the archaeology over there, from what we've looked at, uh, uh, serum dishes occasionally, uh, is different from what's over on the Egyptian side. Are you saying that there was no caravan transport east-west? <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, I'm saying the major one, the, the east-west ones were up north, oh. up close to the Mediterranean coast. They weren't across the heart of this Sahara. This, this, people didn't go out there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Um, it has been uh, uh, speculated that the very early Not at all. And uh, the other question I wanted to ask was when these people migrated to the Nile Valley, did they find people there? Oh, yeah. But the people that were there uh, slightly before this, all this complexity appears at uh, 6,000 years ago were, um, um, were hunters and fishermen. They didn't have, and there's no sign of large societies, any organization to the societies or anything else. The, uh, the, the, the Neolithic societies that are uh, older than, say, about 62, 6,400, something of that sort, are all very small, simple little hunters and villages, hunters and, uh, and fishermen. It's uh, at about the time this thing begins to fold up that you get complex Neolithic societies and pre-dynastic occurs in the Nile Valley. It, it, it may be coincidental, but it's, uh, it's certainly, someone asked first over here. Yes, sir. Years ago, you gave the Water that you oh yeah, no. What we're drinking uh, may not be Pleistocene water. Um, we had um, some of the water dated, <laughs> and uh, it was about 230 years old. So, as I remember, 230, 250 years old. So I, it may have, must have had a rain out there one time. <laughs> there were areas where you were drinking Pleistocene. Oh yeah. Well, when we uh, uh, we. La a year before last, we were working over next to the Libyan border and uh, in, in Sudan in the corner, southwest corner of Egypt, and uh, Chad, that, that right in that area. And um, uh, the water we drank there, we had a drilled well that the uh, General Petroleum Company had drilled and um, pumped water for us, and that water was Pleistocene water. Best tasting, purest water you can imagine. Yes, ma'am. Yes, we do occasionally. Uh, um, we found, uh, I have to say that I, I don't make a big effort to, to dig skeletons. Uh, if we find them and they're, they're there and they're going to be destroyed, we'll, bother, we'll take them up and take them in. But um, our, as a sort of a general policy, we don't dig them. Uh, we may have to take some effort to make, get a larger sample than we've gotten, but um, it's not that I, uh, uh, you know, I used to dig here in the American Southwest, I did a lot of skeleton digging and that sort of thing. But um, uh, skeletons pose a political problem, and skeletons pose a, a, um, a problem in terms of the time it takes to excavate them properly and to curate them properly. That is, these are very fragile, uh, and because the preservation of the bone is, is, very, is not all that good. Um, so we, we, as a policy, don't make an effort to go where they're likely to be grazed. We try to stay away from those. Um, there's a, we, we, uh, we found a, a skeleton at Kubania where I worked for five years and, uh, near the Nile Valley, and we thought it was a very middle, we thought it was a very old one, you know, about 100,000 years old. It turned out not to be, it was about 25,000, but it was still interesting. <laughs> and and uh, uh, we debated when we found it <laughs> whether we were going to find it or not, you know, because it was in bedrock, sort of, it was in, in a sandst sandstone, caliche bedrock, just like a, a, a rock. And we, uh, we realized that it was going to pose a lot of problems because it would have to be, uh, and it did, it had to have a presidential decree before we could get the thing out of Egypt to get it studied. But it's now at the Egyptian Museum, and I, I think they're getting ready to put an installation of the museum exhibit on it, are we? 
<laughs> I hope so. Yes, sir. Where were the rock paintings? Uh, those are from Tassili. Well, that's hard to say because uh, um, they've they've not been uh, there are not very many camps right in cave shelters where these are. There are thought to be there are some others I didn't show you that are obviously later, but they're probably in the neighborhood of uh, six to eight thousand years. Pardon? Um, <clears throat> there is a gentleman by the name of Lahot. Do you know the title of the book? Frescoes of Sicily. Not these. He doesn't. He didn't publish these, but there are some others um, that are in that book. In, in fact, there are hundreds of those frescoes. And if you're interested in that, you, it's a, I believe the book's out of print, but you can probably get it in the library. And I think we have it at the SMU library. I don't know. Um, Angela's more interested in that than I Yes? Yes? Did you think that the dry, rainy season was as abrupt as the cold, hot? <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, I, I'm not sure it happened on the 1st of March like our hot season does. Um, and I'm not, that's not an exaggeration. It's within two or three days of that, it's, it switches just from cold to hot, uh, from you know heavy coats to shorts. Um, the, um, uh, but it, it is clear that from the radiocarbon dates and from the steepness of those things that we had there, it suggested that the periods were A, very pronounced. That is, it really didn't rain. Those basins wind scoured out, uh, and sand dunes migrated in on them. So there was a, and yet, from the radiocarbon evidence, and the dates are so close there, they had to have been 100 to 150 years in duration. So my feeling would be that it probably came on suddenly. You know, one year it was raining like hell, and the next year the rain stopped. Now, we don't know what causes this. That's, uh, uh, th this is not, because just confined, there are other climatic phenomena, other places in the world that are related and somehow related to this we don't understand yet. Somebody over here says, Well, it's sure, uh, I hate to make a generalization like that. Yeah. Well, uh, perhaps the, um, you know, it, uh, it may be something about human nature that, uh, that when, uh, 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 that there were certain phen phenomena that were required in order to, uh, and adjustments and, 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 uh, and technical equipment that had to be mastered and developed in order for those people to live out there. And it's presumably that they either did that or died. And it's the invention is the, what is it they have? But, uh, is that the yeah. And so I would say that, yes, I, I would. Um, uh, uh, and, and a lot of the places where complex societies have evolved, not all of them, but a lot of them have been in places where it's, um, it's precarious. Uh, you go shake off something off a tree and eat it. To, yeah. yeah. Well, and there had to be a, a, a different technology developed for the Egyptians to, be, to develop their agriculture. That is, this basin agriculture that the Egyptian civilizations had would have been very difficult to have been brought in from the Levant where they were using something that was more like what was going on out in the desert here, where they would, as soon as it got dry, as soon as the water had dried up, they would then plant their crops in these in these areas so that they'd take advantage of the of the wet. Yes. You had one picture where you dug your well. It only appeared to be about two or four feet. And yes, there were other places where you dug down with like 10, 15, 20 feet deep. Is the water table fairly? <laughs> well, it would vary. It would vary. First, first of all, uh, not the deep the water. And I'm sure they did a lot of dry holes. <laughs> sure they did, because. Uh, uh, you get your water not necessarily in the center of the basin. It's a tendency that the deepest part of the center is going to be the deepest part, but it's not always. And there may be subsurface rock uh, or some other thing that causes you to have a perched water table. In fact, most of the ones we found, we discovered that they have a perched water table there that's, uh, that there's a bedrock underneath that's caused the, caused the water to be higher there than other places. Uh, 
the, the well we dug, yes, the, that, that well got bigger, of course, as we were there longer. But uh, the, the, uh, uh, we got, to, of course, and there's another thing. Uh, you saw one of the three or four or five places in that whole Sahara where you, could, where you can get water today, yes. And uh, every one of those our Bedouins know about because they used to use those things in their, in their uh, activities uh, uh, running. Well, I'll, I'll have to tell you a, a little story. that uh, we, we found an, a World War II aircraft out there that had uh, fallen down and uh, not been located. And uh, uh, it had been partially buried in a sand dune and partially exposed. And <clears throat> we have a, you know, there, there are sort of rules among who gets what. And uh, the, the aircraft belonged to them, the, to our Bedouins, and they were scavenging. Well, uh, everything that could be gotten off was, was done. That is, all the aluminum was, was stripped off and all of the, and it's back in Cairo and went in some tin cans or something. And, and, on, and the 50 calibers went out and they went to Chad. <laughs> they, were, they were having you know, one of their perennial uh, squabbles down there and somebody wanted some 50 calibers. Any other questions? Yes, sir. No more on the same topic. As you dug that well, was, how much water could you take from it before it would start going down? And would it fill back up? And oh, yeah, every, every, day, every day. Uh, well, we had at the camp that that well came from, there were about 40 people. And we used about three gallons of water per person per day. Now, that's for everything, including all the baths you want. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and everything you're going to drink and all the cooking that's going to be done and all the dishwashing that's going to happen and all the clothes washing you're going to do, uh, er every, that's the total amount. And each of us gets about a, uh, a gallon uh, or so a day as our allotment. And uh, so with 40 people there uh, and uh, three, maybe four gallons, we never ran it dry, um, but we, um, uh, you know, you take the water and then go back in a little while and empty some more. It was a, a perched water table. Yes. You mentioned that they had a very ingenious way of cultivating. And yes. I think I missed. <clears throat> well, I, I didn't get into it because we're running off, off on time, but I, uh, they used a, a system that's not really very different from what some of our, our farmers do today. That is, as soon as the rains were over and the, uh, and the grounds were exposed, the areas, you can't go down in the bottoms of those playas because they have uh, self-swallowing clays, you know, it's very, very, very hard to cultivate there. And, and so that wouldn't be a place they would cultivate, but the shores, the sides of them would be sandy or silty, you see, and those would be the places. And as soon as that was, was uh, uh, the water had passed down and while the ground was still moist, they would plant the crop. It had to be a quick harvesting crop so, but they were successful in it because we find the seeds and we find the grinding stones and we find those people still living there. You know, they, they still they, do that that, today? No, no, there's no one out there today, but those, but those other people do. Is that a method of cultivation? Yes, that's a method. method. Well, our Bedouins, <coughs> who claim title to you know, all that desert, uh, there, there are places where there are blocked dunes, where there are dunes that uh, uh, block uh, wadis, arroyas, where there's an arroyo and it's been blocked by dune that crosses it. Well, they watch these spots, and when the rain comes, and the rain will come every now and then, a rain will come, and they rush out there, and they plant immediately. They go there while the water's still there, and as soon as that water goes down, <coughs> they plant. They go away. Nobody ever bothers them. And then, you know, what is it? Eight weeks later, a month, two months? I don't know how, how long it takes for them. This is maize that they plant now. They don't, they don't do it with wheat and barley. They, uh, at least my group doesn't. And uh, uh, they go back out and harvest it. Nobody bothers it, but it's, it's uh, and this is how, when we watched this, we knew how the people out there were doing the same thing. And, yes, sir. The uh, rainstorms that had, were they lightning and thunder with them? Well, uh, the rainstorms, they, you know, I don't know. The rainstorms they have today, um, uh, I guess I'd have to say the rainstorms that, I, that we have in Fasher, which would be more like what it was there, they have lots of lightning and thunder. Yeah, they're very, and they're uh, very uh, strong thunderstorm-like things. Um, and uh, it, was, um, you know, it was essentially a, a mon summer monsoonal rainfall pattern. 
Well, I have one more question. Yes. Well, let's see. If you, well, I'll take two then. Yes. <laughs> and the sheep goat. Um, there, there is a later, <clears throat> and I may have been earlier. We just didn't find bones of them. Uh, there, there are domestic dogs, big dogs, um, that were presumably helpful in. I don't know what they were hunting or what, or they were using them for helping with sheep. But there is a. Uh, but that's. Uh, near the end of the, of the time we find it. But the sheep goat, and when they came, uh, they were there about maybe around 7,000 years ago. The cows were there much earlier. Hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, would you please stand up so I can hear it? I couldn't hear it. Well, <clears throat> Maybe I can answer that by telling you. Uh, I had been working in Egypt <coughs> for uh, uh, since 1962, and I started working there with a, a young gentleman, young boy who was a graduate student, and who's now a vice minister in Egypt, and uh, uh, another uh, man who went to graduate school with me at Harvard, and and, uh, and a geologist who was in a young assistant professor at the University of Cairo in 62, and he got to be a vice minister. And, uh, uh, and almost immediately after he started working with this second one, he started working with us, he got to be, uh, he was taken and introduced, to, he did a beautiful book, and he was taken and introduced to Nasser. And Nasser said, well, I've got a man like bright as this around here in Egypt, you're going to be my science advisor. So he got to be science advisor, and about a month later he made him, pointed him to the parliament, and about a, you know, a month or so later, well, somebody, he got to be a real good friend of the Speaker of the Parliament, had to be a man named Sadat. And, uh, uh, the, and it wasn't long, he was chairman of the Appropriations Committee. Well, that had a lot of power, you know, like they are here. Uh, anyway, this gentleman helped me a lot. Both these gentlemen helped me a lot. They, we, you know, they were just the secret of our success is the friends that we have in Egypt. Uh, not just them, but all these other people. The, uh, uh, in 1967, we had been working from 1962 to 1967, always along the Nile. We had gone out in the desert a little bit, but it was close to the Nile, 30, 40 miles from the Nile. We had always, in the, where the reservoir was or in areas where, where they were going to be destroyed, where the site's going to be destroyed by the new reclamation projects that we're going to be putting in. And uh, you know, Egypt, it was not a happy place in 67 because of the war. And then in 68 and 69, security got ever increasingly tighter. Um, uh, unlike most foreigners, I was allowed to come back because of my friends and work in Egypt in 68 and 69. But uh, we were about the only ones who were working in Egypt. Um, and then uh, in 69, we were told, really don't work here anymore for a while. We don't want anybody in the, in the Nile Valley because of the uh, security concerns they had that, you know, they had rockets and it was a, uh, they had um, rearmed considerably. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my friends put their heads together and they said, what can we do with Windorf? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they, um, they said, uh, uh, they went to the security people and said, is there any place in Egypt that they could go that you wouldn't be worried about them? And uh, they said, well, what about way out in the Sahara? <laughs> now, when I was told, Fred, you can go and work in the Sahara, I was not happy. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, but I went. And it turned out, you know, that hell, there's archaeology on every, on every rock out there. It's just, you know, everything is full of archaeology there. And so, yeah, it was a huge surprise to find all these people out there. And, uh, and the complexity of it. Um, we, we're, uh, we've got a lot more to learn. As you've heard, a lot of what I'm saying is my hypothesis. But a lot of this stuff needs to be further documented, needs to be you know, amplified and, debated and so on. And I'm sure if I don't get to get it all done, there's going to be one of my colleagues and students who's going to carry on. Well, I think that ought to, did that answer you? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much.